Well, good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone here today. We didn't know we were going to be here today, did we? Hmm. You know, it's, uh, it's the day before Christmas. Everyone knows that. Um, kind of a wide array of thoughts and emotions, I guess, um, with all that's the passing of Elmer and the Christmas season. Um, you know, God became man. That's what Christmas is about. God had to become a man to be able to die. That was, that was what his goal was. That's why he came to die, so that we could live. And <clears throat> it's because of that that, that gives us hope um, for Elmer and for each of us. That's the only um, source of our hope. And so, yeah, I'd um, like, to, like to pause for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for your presence with us. Thank you for, for all that you have done to to provide salvation to mankind. We pray now that you would bless, especially for the family, that you would give them comfort and strength. And I pray that today's service would be a very meaningful time for them. That they could process and reflect and grieve. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. The reading of the obituary, Elmer Menno Yoder, 82, Myersdale, PA, passed away peacefully from natural causes in his home, surrounded by his family. He was born August 16, 1938, to Walter and Annie Yoder. He was preceded in death by his parents and a brother, Homer P. Yoder. Survived by his wife of 54 years, Sarah Zook Yoder, Two daughters, Carol J. and husband Kenneth Tice, Salisbury, PA, and Christina R. Yoder, Myersdale, PA. Seven grandchildren, Christopher and wife Malia Tice, Bethany, and husband Josh Vasquez, Conrad and wife Tori Tice, Leanne, and husband Derek Yoder, Nathaniel Tice, Nicole Tice, Janine Yoder, and two great grandchildren. Elena Joy Vasquez and Christopher Scott Tice Jr. Two sisters, Viola and husband Noah Petersheim, Warrington, Virginia, and Loretta Yoder, Myersdale, PA. A sister-in-law, Martha Yoder, Catlett, Virginia, and several nieces and nephews. Elmer accepted Jesus as his savior in his youth and was a faithful member of Mount View Mennonite Church where he was known as a smarty man by the children at church. Even the adults would receive Smarties when they shook hands with him. He was a dairy farmer and enjoyed his Guernsey cows and Alice Chalmers tractors. After he sold the farm, he was a taxi driver for the Amish community. Elmer was a gentle, easygoing man who loved his family deeply, and he will be greatly missed by all who knew him. At this time, uh, there will be uh, two songs and Immediately after that, uh, the message by Junior Beachy. First song we'll be singing is Silent Night. Silent night.
Next song is Take Time to Be Holy. <laughs> Take time to be holy. Speak up with the Good morning and greetings in Jesus' name. 
As I was sitting back there this morning, watching the slideshow, different pictures of Elmer throughout his life, it struck me what the last one was. It said, if I remember right, it said Elmer Yoder, 1938, there was a dash in 2020. For all of us here, there's a birthday and there's a dash, but we don't know what that last number is going to be. For Elmer, that time has come. His body on this earth is done. It's useless. And at a funeral is a good time to remember that our time's coming too. So as I think of Elmer Yoder, I think of a very quiet man. I never saw Elmer come up here and cut loose. <laughs> I asked his family if he ever taught Sunday school, and they weren't quite sure if he ever did or not. He was a very quiet man. From what they said, he was a gentleman. I also know Elmer had a sense of humor. He was known here at church as the smarty man. Um, I think at our house when we mentioned that Elmer Yoder passed away, the, the way the children knew who we were talking about for sure was the smarty man. And, and I, I noticed it said something in the program that even adults got smarties from him sometimes. I'll make a confession, I was one of them. Uh, Lauren taught me how you do this. If, if Elmer knew what you were up to, when you shook hands, he would hide a pack of Smarties in his hand and you would transfer them. And uh, I think that's just one of the ways where Elmer's sense of humor came through. Um, I appreciated his sense of humor. And probably as I think about his life, his ministry of, of giving Smarties to the children, I personally really appreciate when, when people do little things behind the scenes to bless other people. We often, often look at people who do great, amazing things and they get noticed, but I really appreciate people who do quiet little things behind the scenes, and that's one thing that stands out to me. And that also makes me think, I just want to bless the family, um, Ken and Carol, Janine, Tina, and Sarah, for how you cared for Elmer the last, however long it's been that he was failing. Um, Sarah, I'm not sure the last six months, the last year, the man that you were taking care of in some ways was not the same man you married way back. You no longer could communicate with him the way you did before because of the condition of his mind. And I just want to bless you as a family for how you cared for him. Because that, I believe, is very noble. And that's another one of those things that happens behind the scenes that many times goes unnoticed. But it is very noble. I think it's precious to God, and I want to bless you in that. I think you have loved him well. As I was thinking about what I should share here today... You know, at funerals, we usually talk about a person's good qualities. They're, we give tributes, and they're going to give tributes. And talk about memories. And I'm sure that'll be in the tributes. And that, I believe, is in order, and that is good. But for this time right here, I'm actually going to go a different direction. <clears throat> Elmer had another side to him. From the time he was a small child, he had a tendency to sin. And he did sin. And maybe we don't usually talk about that at funerals. But did you know his sin problem was so bad that he was going to spend eternity in hell unless something happened with it? And if you're not starting to track with me, I'm not picking on Elmer today. <laughs> Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's every one of us. And I think sometimes when we think about somebody sinning, we pick out the individual sins and we think about the badness of it, like how bad was it really? But I think we need to realize the sin problem we have goes bigger than the, the individual sins we commit. We were, yes, created in the image of God, but after the fall, 
sin is in our hearts. And if that is not dealt with, this day looks very different. So we believe when a person dies, they meet God. And if our sin issue was not taken care of, we're destined for hell. And if it was taken care of, we enter heaven. <clears throat> and as Christians, as we come to a funeral, there's often talk about hope. People have confidence that the person who has died, that they will see them again someday in heaven. And the other day when I was talking to the family, Tina mentioned something about, about what Elmer is experiencing in heaven. And so I believe there's hope that Elmer's in heaven. If we think about what, what kind of hope is there for somebody who's died, if you look at it strictly from the physical standpoint of things, this is the end and this is it. It's done. This body is going to rot. And yet we say we have hope. So what for hope is big enough that is bigger than death? Because what is more final than death? So we must base our confidence on something that is bigger than death if we have confidence that after we die, that there is hope. And this, this is not new stuff, but I think at times like this, it is good to reflect. It is good to reflect on whether we are ready to die. It is also good to reflect that if we bear the name Christian, and maybe for us here, because I'm guessing by far the majority of us bear the name Christian if we are truly placing our confidence in what really matters. Hebrews 9.27 says, points out, it is, it is appointed for man once to die, and after that comes the judgment. And as I said, on a day like this is a good time to reflect on what really matters when we come to that day. So if we think about Elmer again here a bit, what is it that gives us hope? What is it that took care of his sin problem? You know, he was a church member here for many, many years. Is that enough? He blessed many children by giving away Smarties. How many Smarties do you think he had to give away to stand before God and say, and God to say, you know what, this is enough. You can come in. He seemed like a really nice person. Did that cut it? And if we want to do the whole judging thing that way, he, I don't know if he ever had devotions or preached. That looks kind of spiritual, doesn't it? Maybe that's kind of a, a negative side. Did the Smarties balance that all out? We know the answer, don't we? Acts 4.12 and there is salvation in no one else, for there, there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Did you catch that? There is no other name. And this is the Christmas season. And in Matthew, it talks about when the angel came to Joseph and tell him to go ahead and take Mary as his wife when, after he found out she was pregnant. And he said about Jesus, about the baby in Melody, or in... Um, in, in Mary's womb. That was not an announcement, by the way. <laughs> For the visitors, my wife's name is Melody. So. <laughs> anyway, it, speaking of Mary, it, say, it says, and she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for, he, for it is he who will save his people from their sins. And once again, I just wanted to point it out with that, that, um, that the answer for a sin problem is in Jesus Christ, period. Amen. And I said something about having a hope that is bigger than death. Merle mentioned that Jesus had to come to earth so he could die. 
But do we realize one of the reasons he died was to show that he's bigger than death? It couldn't hold him. That's Jesus Christ, and that is where our confidence has to be if we're going to have hope. You know, I was recently thinking about a situation about someone that I didn't know well, but I knew the person who had done some fairly horrible things. And from, from what I know, they were a professing Christian. And it, it was a major sin. I still think it was a major. I still think it was horrible. But as I was thinking about what all happened, I got very angry. I was like, how can somebody do that? See, I never did what that person did. And as I was sitting there stewing away, a question came to me. And I, I kind of have the feeling it came from God. It said, do you think that person needed the salvation of Christ more than you do? And I knew the answer. But folks, sometimes we forget that. If we grow up living what the world calls a good life or the people around us call a good life, we can sometimes kind of base our confidence on that. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying good works don't matter. James says that faith without works is dead. But I suggest to you the good works that we do are simply evidence of the faith we have in Christ. And that faith needs to bear evidence. But the evidence is not what saves us. It is the reality of what Jesus Christ has done. And we must stay rooted in that. Yes, pursue good works. Yes, do them. Live out our salvation. But at the end of life, they will not cut it. So there may be some here thinking that they've done, lived a pretty good life that just might be good enough. Let me tell you 100%, absolutely not. There is only one way and only one person, and that is Jesus Christ. There may be others here who say what they've done is so terrible that what Christ has done is not enough. It's a lie from the pits of hell. You and I are not enough, but Christ is more than enough. And so thinking about Elmer today, if we look back through his life and weigh the good and the bad, and I didn't know Elmer for that many years, I see Loretta and Vi there, they could probably give a lot more of the good and the bad than a lot of can, his family can. If we weigh those out, and say there was more good than there was bad, or the bad wasn't so bad, and the good was pretty good, and we go by that, I'm going to say, I have no confidence. But if the evidence of his life <clears throat> pointed to a confidence in Jesus Christ, <clears throat> then we can have hope, and then we can have confidence. And like I said, this is not new stuff. <clears throat> but I believe at a time like this, it is a good time to reflect about where our confidence and our hope truly lies. I would like to close with three verses from John chapter 3, <clears throat> verses 16, 17, and 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world should be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe in he who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. Does it get much clearer than that? He who believes in him is not judged, but he who does not believe has been judged already. And people, I think that's something even at a time like this that we can rejoice in. And that's something we can have hope in because we have a hope that is bigger than death, we have a living hope. And that is Jesus Christ. Let's pray.
Heavenly Father, I just come to you now. Thank you for the life that Elmer lived. Thank you for the ways that his life displayed your character. Each of us have been created in your image, and I believe each of us display your character in your image in sometimes maybe unique ways, different ways from each other. And I thank you for the ways that Elmer's life did that. And help us to, to learn from that. God, also pray for the family. Bless them abundantly, I pray, for their care of Elmer here in his last years of his life. And um, I just pray that you bless them with your peace, your comfort through this time of his passing. And be very near to them. And God, I, I just thank you so much that though we as humans didn't deserve it, we weren't worthy of it, that because of your love and your mercy, you saw fit to give us abundant provision to spend eternity with you. Pray that if there's anyone there who has not surrendered their life to you and placed their faith in you, that they would do that. Because at the end of life, that is what really matters. I pray that you would just bless the remainder of the service to your honor and glory. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, uh, we will be led with a song again, and then following that, there will be reading of tributes by uh, grandson Conrad and daughter Tina. Following that, two more songs. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. I invite you to stand as we sing this together. <laughs> God sent his son, they called him Jesus. He came to love, heal and forgive. He lived and died to buy.
be seated. I just want to thank you all for coming, and it means a lot, and thank you to those that are watching um, on the live stream, and thanks to Mountain View Church here for making that available. We, in typical 2020 fashion, here we are on Christmas Eve at a funeral, and, uh, you know, but we didn't plan that, but God's, God's timing is perfect, and he's sovereign, and we just feel like we have so much to be thankful for. Um, and we as a family want to express that to, to everyone we feel so cared for during this time. And it just, it means a lot. And, you know, I just feel like we have, we have really been blessed. Um, it's maybe not the journey we would have chosen to walk, but um, a couple weeks ago I thought, you know, we can either sit and cry because we need to get a hospital bed and a lift and all that stuff, but you know, or we can be thankful that God provided it whenever we needed it. And um, so I just want to share a few memories. Um, you know, where do you start when you talk, try and talk about a lifetime of memories? But, you know, and I feel that who we are is shaped and influenced by those that are closest to us. And I'm so blessed to have had a godly father who loved me, you know, not because of my abilities or successes or lack thereof, but, um, you know, just because I was his daughter. And he was faithful to God and to mom, and um, that just means a lot. I don't really, I don't have any bad memories of him. He was, um, he was a good father, and he cared well for us. I know him and mom had their disagreements sometimes, but I never, you know, heard them have an actual fight. And, uh, you know, Mom said she has many good memories of him. You know, they shared 54 years together. And uh, they met whenever Mom moved to this community and worked at the Goodwill Mennonite Nursing Home. And Dad used to like to joke that he met Mom at the nursing home, and he thought she was too young to stay there, so <laughs> he got her out. And uh, that was something he liked to joke about. One of my earliest memories of him is him leading his family in family devotions and in prayer and I don't know we thought maybe he taught Sunday school one time and he really didn't like it so he <laughs> but you know he led his family and um, I remember him you know he'd get down on the floor and play with us girls chase us around the house and I know it got pretty noisy sometimes mom uh, it got a little bit much for her but um, and that's a side that probably most people didn't see but it was special to us I also remember often going home from church and about the last mile or two before we got home he'd let me scoot over and sit on his lap in front of him and steer the car and I just thought that was that was great fun um, I also remember sometimes if we'd be at church in the evening and I'd fall asleep on the way home and then he would take me and carry me into the house and sit me on the kitchen table and I think sometimes I even pretended to be asleep just so he'd carry me into the house. But um, I don't ever remember being spanked my, by my dad. He left the dirty work to mom, I guess. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, <laughs> just being a threat of a spanking from him or a stern look was enough. And he had this thing where he would, he would grab a hold of your wrists and just squeeze real tight there. And, you know, if if you struggled, the tighter he squeezed, but, you know, if you held still, then, you know, he would, he would let go. So he kind of had a vice grip, and uh, that came in handy one time when the neighbor man um, was upset at him and wanted to fight with him, and, and I don't know if he swung at him or not, but um, Dad just got hold of both of his hands and just held on, and this man was quite a bit bigger than my dad. But uh, he just held on and squeezed, I guess, that vice grip. And, and I think the guy decided it wasn't worth it, and he soon walked away. And Dad said later he was surprised how weak the guy was. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, anyway, Dad, he was a dairy farmer. You know, we grew up on the farm, and, and it was hard work. We, but he always made work fun. I mean, there was always little games that we, that we played. We had little things back and forth. One, 
I know one thing, he had this pocket knife, and I don't know what happened to the, the blades. The blades broke off, and so they just had little stubs. But he would use this, you know, he'd carry it in his pocket all the time. It worked great to open a hay bale, you know, to cut the string on the hay bale. Well, we'd take his knife and hide it from him, and then, you know, he'd find it again, and we always had this back and forth thing with his knife with the broken blades that we thought was useless, but he, it was important to him. Um, he also, oh, well, uh, my sister used to, it was only two of us girls, my sister used to say she didn't need a brother because she had me, but uh, then Ken came along and worked for my dad, and then he ended up marrying the farmer's daughter, but he had to work about 11 years before he got her. Uh, <laughs> Dad taught me that a job worth doing was a job worth doing right, and he was very particular with his equipment and vehicles. And, and I remember one time we had gotten a new car. It was a used car, but it was new to us, and it was a shiny Buick with Buick Park Avenue, I think. He always liked Buicks. And uh, about a day or two after we had gotten the car, we had it parked there in the driveway, and then we had loaded the riding lawnmower onto the back of the pickup truck, and I was going to take it over to Lauren Bender's to get it fixed or something. So, and I was young, I, you know, hadn't been driving real long, and so then I went to back up. I didn't see the car behind me, and as I was turning, I just backed into the car and put a big, long scratch down the, both doors on the side, and I thought, oh boy, so I just, you know, took off and went to the <laughs> repair shop and you know it's not that far away and I thought boy I just don't want to go back home and I this was it was a horrible feeling and I just took my good old time going back home and but you know dad never he didn't scold me or reprimand me I mean I he just you know he took care of it and and got it fixed and he didn't you know make me feel bad but that I mean he saw that I did feel bad, and I think he thought that's probably enough of a lesson, but um, that's kind of the, just the kind of man he was. He was gentle and easygoing, and it's because of, you know, what Junior said, because of Jesus in his life um, that he could be that way, because, um, you know, he had a sinful nature just like the rest of us. Um, I never saw him cry very much. One of the only times that I saw him cry was when we went to see Lewis, who was the bishop at the time, to tell them that I was expecting with an unplanned teenage pregnancy. I don't know what ex emotions he was experiencing, but he always accepted Janine and was a father figure to her growing up. And he always made sure her and I were taken care of. He also welcomed his mother-in-law into his home for the past, like the last seven years of her life. and. He loved Grandma, I think, just like his own mother, and they used to uh, used to take her to Florida, go to go to Florida with her, and he just uh, he was just that kind of person that he was very accepting of other people, and um, you know, gentle and easygoing. We uh, we didn't take a whole lot of family vacations. Because, uh, I mean, we're dairy farmers. You don't have time to do a lot of vacations. But the ones that we did take were very memorable, you know, the times that we did do something. And one of the most memorable ones was when our family and Raymond and Martha's family packed into one motor home and drove out west for a couple weeks. Um, I was young, and me and my sister were young, and Brad and Brian and Marla you know, we're young, and I just, I think about it now, two families in one motor home and traveling across the west, out to the, we didn't go quite to the west coast, but that was special that we got to do that, and, you know, we would, we did a lot with Raymond and Martha's family, and uh, we would go different places, even go to an amusement park, and Martha took her first roller coaster ride, and I think probably the last one that she <laughs> ever took, she, I, I loved roller coasters and nobody would go with me, so Martha went with me one time, but I never convinced her to go again. So, um, and Dad always liked to tease Martha, and so they had they had a lot of fun, a lot you know, of back and forth times. And I thought, what a blessing to have. Well, Raymond and Martha got 
married two weeks before mom and dad, and so they've just been best friends. And um, I thought, what a blessing to have a lifetime of friendships, you know, with someone. And um, so that's that was a special memory too. And I don't I don't really have an an ending here. Connor is going to share some memories from the grandchildren, and um, but I just want to thank you again everyone that came and everyone that expressed an interest and, um, you know, that's been caring for us, you know, the last, the last several months. And we, we really do appreciate it. We're, we really are blessed. So thank you. Good morning. Well, I have the privilege and honor of reading this tribute to, to Grandpa. I'm going to ask Tina to mention this is a collection of memories from the grand ch grandchildren, as well as a little history about his beloved Smarty Ministry. So Elmer's Smarty Ministry began nearly 40 years ago when Phil and Ruth Beachy's children were little. Anthony, Janelle, Amy, and Anita were pretty close in age, and since Sarah was Ruth's sister, we spent a lot of time with her family. Sometimes after church, the children would want to go with Elmer's. If they weren't allowed to, they would start crying, and when one started crying, they all cried. <laughs> so Elmer started taking Smarties along for them so they wouldn't cry. Apparently, other children started noticing this, and then he would slip them a Smartie too. Before long, every Sunday after church, the children would make their way to find the Smartie man. If there were visitors at church, the children made sure to help the visiting children find the Smartie man too. He would load his pockets down Sunday mornings, and he always kept an extra bag in the car in case he ran out. When, children, when the children grew up, a few of them figured out if they put out their hand to shake his hand with them, they would also find a Smarty there as well. So one of Chris's favorite memories is how Grandpa and Grandma would take them out to eat every year for their birthday. They would let the grandchild choose where they wanted to go, and I think they got to eat at some places they never would have gone to otherwise. Grandma said it started with Burger King when we were young, and the places gradually got better as we got older. <laughs> the restaurants became places like Sand Springs, Olive Garden, the Hen House, and many others. The family trips that we took to the beach every year were very special, and we made a lot of good memories as well. Bethany's earliest memories are of how her and Janine would argue over whose grandpa he was. <laughs> Janine was sure he only belonged to her, and Bethany said he was her grandpa, too. Bethany and Janine both remember sitting on his lap, sharing his breakfast with him, eating cereal out of a bowl, one on each knee. It always tasted better out of his bowl. It was cornflakes with some canned fruit and either a cookie or piece of cake in it. The funny thing is that both Carol and Tina did the same thing when they were little, and I don't know if he actually got much to eat or not when they did that. Janine remembers going on the tractor with him when he did field work. He would always share his lunch and let her eat his peanut butter and maple syrup sandwiches. And Tina also remembers eating peanut butter and maple syrup sandwiches on the tractor with him as well. Janine also used to play checkers with him, but was never able to beat him. And he was also quick at playing tag, and it was hard to get him last. <laughs> I remember how Grandpa had such a kind and gentle demeanor about him and admired his grateful and humble attitude. I finally remember when we would visit their house and would often see him sitting at the table, reading a newspaper, or doing one of his crossword puzzles. I specifically remember one Thanksgiving where Grandma was running around the kitchen working on food and the phone started ringing. She yelled, Elmer, can you grab the phone, please? Grandpa looked up and said in his joyful yet serious tone, Sarah, I'm busy doing my crosswords. <laughs> I also remember Grandpa praying before the meals we would share. He would always thank the Lord for all that they were blessed with and to be kept mindful of how much they had in comparison to so many in the world. He would also thank God for a healthy mind and body, even in the latter part of his life when he was suffering the effects of dementia. Leanne remembers that whenever Grandpa's would take them out to eat for their birthdays, sometimes she would sit on the front seat between them and Grandpa would let her steer the car. She thought this was pretty fun, but it almost gave Grandma a heart attack. <laughs> One of Nathaniel's favorite memories is when he would come to Grandpa's house, and with a grin on his face, he'd reach into his pocket and pull out some candy that he'd slip to us. 
He did this almost every time without fail. Nicole remembers when she would tell her friends from Mountain View who her grandpa was, and they would gasp and say, your grandpa is the smarty man? These are but a few words on a couple sheets of paper that describe the many memories that grandpa made with each one of us. Of course, a few words can't properly do justice to describing every aspect of the character and personality of the wonderful man that Elmer is. And I say is because we know that while he may have left stuff physically, he is now more alive than ever before while worshiping in the presence of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The memories we have shared with him will live on in our minds and hearts, and we're thankful for all of the moments that we got to share with him. Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 4 says, For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. Even while now is the time to mourn the passing of Elmer's physical body, may we be encouraged and reminded of the hope and joy that we have in Christ and expectedly look forward to the day of joining those who have gone before us in Christ. I didn't ask if I could say anything, but one thing that I do remember is that Elmer Lock liked his chocolate pie. And just want to tell Sarah, I don't think he's saying I should have anymore. That's kind of an inside joke from our Western trip. Let's sing uh, Sweet By and By. <clears throat> There's a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see it afar, for the Father waits over the way to repair us a dwelling place there in the song is I'll Fly Away. <clears throat> mm -hmm. 
Some glad morning when this life is o'er, I fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I fly away. I fly away, oh glory. to pause for a closing prayer father in heaven thank you for this time that we could spend together in honor of elmer's life just commit the family into your hands believe that they were preparing just days ago to to care for him for perhaps many days and now that has all changed. So I pray your grace upon them as they grieve and as they, as they make adjustments again. I pray that your grace would be upon them and you would guide them. I pray your blessing on all those who came, perhaps some from fair, fair distance. We pray that you would protect them as they travel home. We ask all of this in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. So um, the family viewed prior to the service, but in just a moment, uh, the rest of us will have the opportunity to, to view. So uh, at this time, the uh, funeral director will come and open the casket, and then our ushers will um, usher you through. You can, you can view and, and return to your seat.
there there will not be a graveside service. Uh, we will have the committal here. So, uh, Terry, if you can come for that. It has come to the time when we commit Elmer's body back to the ground. In Genesis 3.19, when God was uh, pronouncing the curse after Adam and Eve had sinned, he had said, by the sweat of your brow you eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. Elmer's physical body has is the way is the way we, we knew him by his physical body that's how we knew who elmer was um but that was just the shell that he lived in while he was here on earth and the time for his body has been completed um it is finished here on on earth job 14 5 says man's days are determined you have dream you have decreed the number of his months and have set limits he cannot exceed and Psalm 139, 16 says, All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. So God knew. He knows when our time is up, before we ever were born, he knows when he knew when Elmer's time was completed. But we know that Elmer, as the real person, is more alive than he ever was. Before we have the committal prayer, I'd like to read 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. And that's a passage looking to the future, um, which can give us cause for great rejoicing and hope, even in the midst of sorrow. And that says, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven, and with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with the Lord in the air, and so will we, it. And so will we be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this service that we had here today in uh, celebration of Elmer's life. We pray your blessing on the family as they go through this time of grieving and closure and not having him here anymore on this earth, but thank you for the, the hope that you have given us that we can encourage each other with those words. We thank you for that sure and certain hope that as Christ lived, and was the first to rise from the dead, we too shall have a new life and will join our Heavenly Father along with the saints in heaven. We therefore commit Elmer's body to the earth from which he was made and lay to rest this mortal body that it might, be put, that it might put on immortality, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And Lord, I just pray your, your continued blessing on the family as they move on from here and Pray that you would just give them joy of hope in the future, even as they grieve the loss of, of the here and now. In your name we pray, amen. This time we turn it over to uh, Newman's staff. 